outside the timeless age of the world itself, 150 years is only the twinkling of an eye. Yet, within that brief span of history, almost unbelievable changes have taken place. A century and a half ago, most of the empires of the world were ruled by ancient cities. Constantinople, Paris, and London were more than a thousand years old. Rome, more than 2,000. But far across the wide Western Ocean, on the shores of the North American continent, was a newborn republic. The United States of America, whose capital had changed with the frequency born of turmoil and invasion. Founded in Philadelphia, the revolutionary government had moved south to Baltimore and Maryland, back to Lancaster and Pennsylvania, then to nearby York, to Princeton in New Jersey, south again to Annapolis, north again to Trenton, and on to New York. A permanent capital was urgently needed. But where? Rivalry between cities and states was intense. To solve the problem, the Constitutional Congress decreed the building of a new federal city, centrally located between the North and South. President George Washington, authorized to select the site, chose the spot where the Potomac and Anacostia rivers join. A 10-mile square section of Maryland and Virginia became the Federal District of Columbia. Later, the land across the Potomac was returned to Virginia. To plan the federal city which would bear his name, Washington appointed Major Pierre Charles L'Enfant. L'Enfant envisioned a city of magnificent views with broad avenues radiating like the spokes of wheels, great public buildings, parks, and monuments. A genius was little appreciated during the days of life before he received the honor his plans deserved. Today, a beautiful tomb in Arlington National Cemetery preserves the memory of Pierre Charles L'Enfant. Carved in the stone is the plan he created, the President's House, the Capitol on the Hill, the Mall, the Great But across the river, the dreams of L'Enfant and Washington have grown and continue to grow as the plan takes shape. The Great Capitol on the Hill, the Green Mall sweeping toward the banks of the river, the Great Open Vistas, the broad radiating avenues just as L'Enfant envisioned them in his mind's eye. There are the shaded squares where leisure strollers may enjoy the beauties of the city. There are monuments to honor for all time the heroes of a young and growing nation and the men who held her firmly on the course of freedom and perpetual unity. There are the landscape parks, the trees and flowers, world-famous scientific institutions and galleries of art, huge buildings, heroic in their design and awe-inspiring in size to house the multitudinous functions of the government. The history of our country is preserved in the National Archives building, adorned with heroic statues and crowned by a huge sculptured pediment. Here, this may see the priceless documents which gave birth to our nation and established our form of government. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States of America. Formally kept in the Library of Congress, these precious documents are the very foundation of our freedom and our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Every American should be familiar with the Constitution, the basic law of our land. This inspired document prescribes the formation and function of the government. Article 1 sets up a legislative branch, the Congress of the United States, to make our laws and provide the funds to carry them out. The stately capital has been the home of Congress since the year 1800. 
At first, there were only 26 senators, two from each state as provided by the Constitution, and only 65 members of the House of Representatives. And the capital itself was small. But the world's newest nation began to grow with astonishing speed. The Treaty of 1783, which ended the revolution, extended the territory of the original 13 states westward to the Mississippi River. In 1803, the vast territory of Louisiana was purchased from France by Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States. The border with Canada was straightened after the War of 1812. Florida was ceded by Spain in 1819. The Republic of Texas, once part of Mexico, joined the Union in 1845. And a year later, the Oregon country was added. The Mexican session of 1848 brought in California and much of the Southwest. And in 1853, the Gadsden Purchase straightened out our Southwest border. By 1865, 24 new states had been formed and admitted into the Union. And in Washington, the great building on Capitol Hill had finally been completed, much as we know it now. Today, the Norig Senate Office Building provides additional space needed for offices, conference, and committee rooms for 96 senators from 48 states. In the South, we require two additional office buildings to provide space for all their legislative duties. For more than a million visitors each year who come to Washington from everywhere, the Capitol itself heads the list of things they want to see and pictures they want to take. In the great rotunda beneath the dome, huge paintings portray momentous events in American history, including the signing of the Declaration of Independence. In Statuary Hall stand sculptured notables from almost all the states. Here are historic figures such as Daniel Webster and works of art such as Gutsum Borglum's Head of Lincoln. Visitors may literally spend hours seeing all the attractions in and around the great building which houses the legislative branch of the government. Article two of the Constitution creates the second great branch of our government, the executive. To every American, the executive branch is symbolized by the White House, both home and office of the chief executive, the president of the United States. Oldest and one of the most beautiful public structures in Washington, the White House has been occupied by every chief executive since John Adams, second president of the United States, and has been visited by millions of Americans from every corner of every state and every walk of life. Though modernized and redecorated inside, the familiar outward appearance of the White House has been preserved unchanged. Everyone has an interest in the President's house. Its occupants have been typical Americans, and any American-born boy can dream of someday calling the White House home. Inauguration Day is a day of days, once in a lifetime for any man, twice at most, for the two-term tradition established by George Washington himself has now become a law of the land. On the 20th day of January, the president-elect takes the oath of office on the steps of the nation's capital. Afterward, the traditional inauguration procession escorts him from the capital to the White House. The massed flags of all the states of the Union precede the president in the line of march. Pennsylvania Avenue, the procession takes its way. 
As Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, the President is escorted by picked detachments from every arm of the military services. Past, present, and future. From battle-seasoned veterans of foreign wars to young cadets who someday will lead our forces of defense. Hundreds of thousands of people along the line of march and tens of millions by radio and television follow the parade as each state in the Union pays its respect to the chief executive. Once at home in the White House, the president steps into the world's biggest executive job. When the city of Washington was founded, the entire federal government had a total of only 126 employees. But as our nation grew, the government grew with it. Today, the seemingly endless executive branches, departments, bureaus, and agencies of every description employ more than two million people whose activities and responsibilities reach into every corner of the land. Departments of cabinet rank include the important State Department, occupying many buildings in Washington and operating embassies and consulates around the world. The gigantic Department of Defense, which includes the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, has its headquarters in the fabulous Pentagon building. Largest office building in the world, the Pentagon has 35,000 employees within its walls and elaborate systems of transportation and reception to get into and out of the building and find one's way around. When it comes to money, the Treasury Department has a lot to do. It has expanded from this old Treasury building to many new buildings, handling many different types of work, including some branches of law enforcement and the printing of money and government securities. Most familiar, of course, is the Post Office Department, whose employees work in every city and town and on every rural delivery route in the land. The Great Federal Triangle houses the headquarters of the Department of Justice and the Departments of Commerce and Labor. There's the Department of Agriculture, whose activities reach into every section of our great agricultural nation. Here, too, is the Department of the Interior, another huge department with employees everywhere. All these and scores of additional administrative agencies make up the enormous executive branch of the government, all under the direct responsibility of the President. The third article in the Constitution creates the judicial branch of the government to consist of a Supreme Court and such lower federal courts as Congress may decree. Justices of the Supreme Court are appointed by the President to serve for life. Their primary duty is to interpret the Constitution. A law declared unconstitutional is automatically void. The court may also rule that an act of the executive branch is unconstitutional, thus limiting the power of the presidency. Any citizen may bring his final appeal to the Supreme Court if he feels that injustice has been done by lower courts of the land. Thus, each of the three branches of government, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial, is tied to the other two. This is the plan of checks and balances by which the designers of our government ensured that the Constitution would be protected and remain a living document. A country's rise to eminence in the world is reflected in the number of countries that send their diplomatic representatives to its capital. From the handful of early years, the foreign embassies and legations in Washington now number more than 70. One of the oldest is the Embassy of Great Britain. Most of them are in the distinctive and beautiful part of Washington's northwest section. 
Some of them are in historic older houses. The building occupied by each embassy or legation is considered a little piece of the soil of its own nation. In beautiful embassy row, 10 foreign nations are represented in a single block. The world press is well represented too. Here in the National Press Club are the offices of most of Washington's 900 reporters and correspondents. Here are the big wire services, both American and foreign, supplying news from Washington to thousands of papers around the world. There are the Washington offices of many of the nation's great daily papers and those of foreign lands. There are motion picture, radio, and television reporters. A million words a day flow out to tell the world what Washington says and does. Here is freedom of speech in action. But lots of people, a million and a half a year, don't just want to hear about Washington, they come to see for themselves. From every state, they come by rail to Union Station, just a stone's throw from the Capitol on the hill. From coast to coast and round the world, they fly into the Washington International Airport, only 10 minutes from the center of the city. Here are welcomed princes and presidents, soldiers and diplomats, businessmen and tourists. Like Washington itself, this beautiful terminal is a crossroads of the world. The welcome sign is always out for visitors from everywhere. But millions of folks who like to do their own piloting and exploring follow the smooth highways that converge on our nation's capital from east and west and north and south perhaps along the beautiful Potomac, and over one of the many bridges that carry the traffic of business and pleasure into and out of the city. When you begin to drive in Washington, a map will help. L'Enfant's great avenues are wide indeed, but with all his vision, he could not have foreseen the automobile. He'd be surprised indeed to see these modern additions to his plan. New visitors, perhaps expecting only shaded streets and quiet parks, are often surprised to find downtown Washington a big, bustling metropolis, one of the finest and busiest shopping centers in the world. Here is a city of hundreds of thousands of workers who man not only the vast machinery of government, but all the normal business of a great city as well. If you want to park your car, streetcars and sightseeing buses will take you anywhere. And Washington is full of fine hotels ready to welcome guests by the tens of thousands. A favorite driving spot for Washingtonians, as well as visitors, is Rock Creek Park, where the creek itself becomes a novel highway. Here's a playground covering 1,800 acres, enjoyed by open-air enthusiasts from spring to fall. Everybody likes the zoo, the National Zoological Park. Here, many thousands of Washington's younger visitors see for the first time in their lives strange creatures from far off parts of the world. Among the zoo's hundreds of inhabitants are many rare specimens, and some that are born comedians. Washingtonians and visitors who follow the fairways find beautiful golf courses in Rock Creek Park. In East Potomac Park, and many other nearby locations. But most of the million and a half yearly visitors are here to see the sights. On the mall is the National Gallery of Art. This gleaming white building of Tennessee marble, opened in 1941, 
is already on its way to housing one of the greatest collections of painting and sculpture in the world. Scientific control of temperature and humidity protects and preserves hundreds of prized works by the great masters. The main floor has almost a hundred separate galleries. On almost any day, serious art students can be seen at work improving their own skills by reproducing the work of the masters. The old red brick building of the Smithsonian Institution has been called the Attic of America, for here are displayed thousands of fascinating relics of our nations growing up. For instance, here's the first solo transatlantic plane, Charles Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis. To youngsters, these models of early cars are only intriguing toys. But to older folk, exhibits like this bring back all sorts of nostalgic memories. Another of the Smithsonian group is the Natural History Museum, where the evolution of life, including man himself, can be studied. This lifelike group shows American Indians who once lived right here where the museum itself now stands. Almost in the shadow of the Capitol is another kind of museum, the United States Botanic Garden, which has several horticultural collections unrivaled anywhere in the world. The greenhouse provides conditions for growing tropical and subtropical plants of many unusual varieties. The oldest section of Washington is historic Georgetown, which was a thriving village long before the site for the capital was chosen. Shaded streets and fine old homes make it one of the most attractive residential areas of the city. Here too is Georgetown University, which George Washington helped to found the oldest and largest of the capital's many fine educational institutions. Another is Howard University, whose campus has more than a score of buildings, mostly Georgian in architecture. Washington's many churches of every denomination symbolize another freedom guaranteed by the Constitution, freedom of worship. Attended by every president of the United States since Madison, St. John's on Lafayette Square is known as the Church of the Presidents. The magnificent Washington Cathedral, one of the largest in the world, has been under construction since 1908. In 1828 was started the construction of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal designed to help build Washington as an important center of trade with the West. Today, visitors may enjoy a leisurely trip along the old canal, drawn by a two-mule power outboard motor. The coming of the railroads made it necessary to abandon the ambitious project even before it was fully completed, and the canal fell rapidly into ruin. But several miles have been reconditioned and preserved as an interesting historic relic. If you want exercise with your history, you can paddle your own canoe. They're available for rent, and the canal makes a perfect setting for the sport. For the devotees of sail, the broad Potomac itself provides a blue expanse of smooth water for this always popular sport. There's racing, too, and the biggest event is the annual regatta, 
when graceful sailing craft cover the water and thousands of spectators line the shores to watch power boats of many classes compete for the President's Cup. A short cruise down the Potomac, or a drive on land, takes you to Mount Vernon, George Washington's great plantation on the river's bank. The beloved home of the father of our country has been preserved just as it was when Washington himself developed the beautiful estate. Here in a simple ivy-covered tomb rests the greatest American and his beloved wife, Martha Washington. And here in Arlington Cemetery lies another great soldier, the unknown soldier watched over by an honor guard of his fellow servicemen and visited by grateful Americans from everywhere. To the thousands of young men who have given our nation not only their lives, but identity as well, this is America's tribute. At the west end of the mall rises a memorial to another great American, Abraham Lincoln, who guided our nation through some of its most perilous years. The thousands who stand in silence before the great and tragic figure take away with them a vivid and lasting memory. Visitors to Washington in cherry blossom time enjoy a fabulous floral display. Planted in 1912, the Japanese cherry trees were presented to the United States by the city of Tokyo. This gleaming structure framed in cherry blossoms and mirrored in the waters of the tidal basin is a memorial to the father of democracy, author of the Declaration of Independence Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States, whose immortal words are still a battle cry for freedom. I have sworn on the altar of God eternal hostility to every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Framed in the distance stands the greatest memorial of all, the towering obelisk of the Washington Monument. One of the tallest masonry structures in the world, its white marble shaft can be seen for miles. Every year, a million visitors come to make the journey by elevator to the top of the monument, 500 feet from the ground. If you're ambitious, you may climb it on foot, but it's a long, long way up, 898 steps. If George Washington could see his city today, if he himself could stand at the top of his own monument with Pierre L'Enfant at his side and look down as we do now, surely they would thrill with pride as millions of other Americans have done. Pride in this magnificent city still growing in fulfillment of the plans they made. Washington, our nation's capital, inspiring symbol of free men in a free world.